The Gerald R. Ford is part of a new class of supercarriers being built by the U.S. to replace the now outdated Nimitz class of supercarriers. And as you may be guessing, they have numerous reasons why they're stronger and basically impossible to destroy. Alright, so a few small things from that first clip. First things first, this is a Nimitz class carrier. This is the USS George H.W. Bush. The one that was shown in the video, that's the USS Midway, and she is basically now a museum ship. So not the ship that was shown visually compared to what was being said. And second, the bigger sort of issue in that first clip was calling the Nimitz class outdated. Um, what? You know, ships aren't things that you buy off a Walmart shelf where after a while, sure, they become old and broken. Ships continue to get maintained, updated with the newest technologies, so on and so forth. The most recent Nimitz class carrier, this one, was commissioned only in 2009. And I guess the only thing that you could say in terms of being sort of outdated might be the fact that the weapon systems, some of the newer ideas that are coming out right now, like the free electron lasers, for example, um, those require power generation that you know some of these older Nimitz class carriers might not be able to produce. But in terms of a capability as a carrier, they're not obsolete or outdated by any stretch of the imagination. A brief word about World of Warships. It's a free-to-play historical online naval combat game made by Wargaming. This is honestly one of the most fun strategy games I've ever played, and you can fight with all kinds of different warships. Every warship is meticulously detailed by the dev team. It takes them an average of six months to detail each unique historical ship in-game. You can see the evolution in aircraft carrier technology and design by commanding ships like the USS Langley, the first American aircraft carrier ever, and the US USS Midway, which served in the Vietnam War. There are four total classes of ships to choose from, a lot of upgrades, and the environments are designed to be as strategic as possible. World of Warships is a thinking man's action game, and one of my favorite things in the game is that it includes some of the most iconic warships in naval history, like the HMS Monarch and HMS Iron Duke. Wargaming currently has over 7 million players worldwide, so try out the game if you're looking for a perfect balance of action and strategic gameplay. Yikes. Um, I'm gonna assume for a second here that Wargaming just gave him a script and said, here, run with it, and here's some, like, pre-roll footage. Um, but yeah, a few small things. First things first, if you really wanted to learn about carrier design and the evolution of the design, um, I would recommend reading this book by Norman Friedman, uh, U.S. Aircraft Carriers and Illustrated Design History. The author's got books also on battleships, cruisers, and I believe destroyers as well. But if you really want to learn about how a certain carrier was designed, uh, you know what compromises had to be made, and what the final design accomplished, this is a phenomenal resource for all of you. Next up, this is Islands of Ice. This is the Islands of Ice that we've had in World of Warships for a very long time. Unfortunately, the Islands of Ice that was shown in the video happens to be this version. This version is from 2015, when World of Warships was still in its closed beta testing. So, <laughs> for this to have been a sponsored video where I'm pretty sure World of Warships provided that sort of add pre-roll content, the fact that they use footage from two whole years ago and is completely outdated is not the most amazing way to promote World of Warships. <laughs> so I just saw that and I just went, oh, can't believe I just, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and once again, this is HMS Monarch Wargaming. This is the historical ship that existed in real life. The version of HMS Monarch you have in your game is complete fiction. It's a ship that basically was on paper. And so for you guys to call that historically iconic ships is just, it's just incorrect. So um, for those of you who want a more detailed explanation, go check out the corrections to the infographics show. I went into a little bit more detail there in that episode about this particular ship.
The ship is powered by two A1B nuclear reactors that generate 600 megawatts of electricity, which is, well, insane. An aircraft carrier like this is essentially a floating city, especially when you consider that the amount of electricity on board could power every single home in Pasadena, California, an actual city with over 140,000 people. This absurd amount of power enables the four to do some pretty incredible things, like being able to essentially travel around around the world forever without ever having to refuel. Theoretically, the carrier could travel continuously for 20 to 25 years around the world without ever needing to stop to refuel. So if the whole planet got destroyed in a nuclear war except for this ship, it would actually be fine for a pretty long time. 600 megawatts of power. That is a lot of power. And it is very useful on a ship. Um, in terms of the Gerald R. Ford, uh, it is used on the electromagnetic aircraft catapult system. It is used for potentially future weapons installations like laser point defense systems or just anything else that really uses the electricity. But, and there's a big but here, it doesn't really have much to do with the propulsion of the ship itself. This is a diagram of a pressurized water naval nuclear propulsion system. And how it works, in theory, is very, very similar to the propulsion systems of ships in World War II. What the nuclear portion does is it provides heat. And what that does is it heats water. And when water gets heated, you get steam. And then what you do with that steam is you run it through a bunch of turbines. Those turbines end up spinning on a shaft at a very, very high amount of RPM, which then has to go through a reduction gear. When it goes through a reduction gear, it goes through something like a 30 to 1 reduction, which results in the actual propeller of the ship spinning at a reasonable rate. Had the propeller been spinning at the same amount of RPM as when it first came out of the main turbine, the ship's propeller would be spinning at a few thousand RPM, which is just a little bit nuts and would most likely break everything. So, you know, this system, if you actually went back and looked at how ship propulsion systems worked in World War II ships, basically the same principle. The only major difference between the World War II ships is that they burned oil, which means that they constantly needed new oil supplies, which means refueling. With the nuclear ships, they can go for 20, 25 years before they need to be refueled, which isn't forever, it's just a very long period of time. And finally, of course, the last thing, which is in the event of a nuclear war where the whole world gets blown up, these ships will going to be okay. Well, the ships might be okay for a while, but the crew are probably not going to be okay for all that long because when you have that big of a ship, you constantly need supplies, medical supplies, you need food supplies and all that stuff. And that has to come from somewhere. And if the whole world gets destroyed, Good luck getting those supplies. I mean, typically speaking, when a ship like a carrier goes out, uh, they are actually followed by support ships like these underway replenishment ships that basically transfer them food supplies, medical supplies, so on and so forth. Guided missiles are probably the most serious threat that can penetrate the swarm of fighters easily, but the ship itself has countless defenses against these, including two RIM-162E SSM surface-to-air missile launchers. Each missile fired from these costs $956,000, or about the price of five median-value homes in the United States. In addition to these surface-to-air missiles, there are three Phalanx CIWS radar-guided 20mm Vulcan cannons on on board that are capable of firing 50 bullets every second at a target. These can easily shred an enemy missile apart at close range. There's also two RIM-116 rolling airframe missile launchers that are equipped to the USS Gerald R. Ford. This is sort of the middle ranged sort of protection. The outer range would be the ESSM, and then it would be this, then it would be the Phalanx. So it might have been just an oversight in that video. Submarines would have an incredibly difficult time destroying the carrier as well, not only because the carrier is quicker than they are, but also because the helicopters on board are equipped with depth charges designed to destroy them underwater. Okay, um, <laughs> there was a few things wrong with that clip. Um, first things first, modern day nuclear powered attack submarines, when they're submerged, their speeds are pretty much on par with the speed of an aircraft carrier. 
Uh, the Russian Akula class submarine can, I think, make about 35 knots. The Chinese Type 93, this one can make approximately 30 knots. Do keep in mind that a lot of their top speeds are also classified, so the exact number is not something that is publicly known, although, you know, good estimates can be made. But even if the carrier can outrun the submarines, I don't think they can really outrun the torpedoes. I mean, the Mark 48 that the US uses, top speed about, what, 55 knots? You talk about the uh, British Navy's Spearfish, this one goes approximately 60 knots. And if you talk about really crazy torpedoes, the Russians have the Schvel, which goes 200 knots underwater. It's a super capitating torpedo. So, carrier can outrun a sub, but not the weapons. And the final thing that is just not right in that clip is that modern day ASW helicopters use depth charges to hunt submarines. Um, depth charges is so 1940s, modern day ASW helicopters use airdropped torpedoes. So yeah, <laughs> completely wrong era of weaponry there. Anyways folks, that's all the little things I wanted to point out and all the corrections I want to offer. One last thing of course to, you know, I guess leave with all of you is that there's no such thing as an unsinkable ship. You know, the Gerald R. Ford, she is fantastically well protected, very well built, but, you know, in the right circumstances, the ship could still sink, just like any other ship in the world. Hell, I thought we learned not to use the word unsinkable when describing ships. Anyways, folks, I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care, have yourselves a good one, and I'll talk to all of you again really, really soon.